Hi everybody, my name is Rob Woods. I'm a professor at the University of Georgia in the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center. I'd like to talk to you today about some of the tools we've been developing to model carbohydrates. This is to generate 3D structures of carbohydrates, glycoproteins, and carbohydrate protein complexes. This work is funded by the NIH, and it's principally done to develop methodologies that are easy for non-specialists to use. And the reason for this is that if you're trying to get modeling into a lab used by people who aren't experienced in modeling, it has to become easier. The analogy here would be something like nuclear magnetic resonance NMR spectroscopy, which is quite complicated, but at the same time widely used. And people who use it don't necessarily know all the details behind the methods that they're using, and therefore it gets widely adopted. And this is the attitude that we're taking in this development. In order for this to work, we have to adopt not only simple point-and-click interfaces, but we have to provide technologies and documentations that allow people to understand what they're doing. So we use uh, videos and online scenarios, and the goal is to create something that has as few clicks as possible to get a good answer. You might think of this as going to a site, for example, to get a mortgage or to get uh, insurance or something like that, where the basic un underlying details are complicated, but you want it very simple. So this is what we're going to do. And the reason for this is because if you can make it simple and get it into wide usage, then you can advance the development of carbohydrate-based drugs or therapeutics that are based on structural information that would otherwise be difficult to get. And the reason we choose modeling as opposed to any other method is that a lot of experimental methods provide only sparse data. That is, they provide data without all the information you need to understand the system. You could think of modeling as being the glue that links disparate bits and pieces of experimental data. It allows you also to ask questions such as, what if this were the case, or what would happen if? You can answer these experimentally, but many times it's quite difficult to do the experiment. And what modeling gives you is the ability to focus your decision on what experiment you want to do. The challenge is, as I mentioned, is that modeling is complicated for non-specialists. And on the flip side, from a, from a non-carbohydrate perspective, people who don't do carbohydrate chemistry find carbohydrate nomenclature extremely complicated. We've all learned to know the names of the 20 amino acids, alanine, glycine, leucine, etc. Well, carbohydrates have the same thing. You have glucose, galactose, fucose, etc. But they also have the complexity of not being linear polymers. As you can see in this picture on the screen, you've got a glycoprotein, and the protein is a blob, and the carbohydrates are shown as circles and squares of different colors. And what you can see right away is they're not linear structures. They're branched like trees. And this makes modeling and carbohydrate chemistry in general quite challenging. So here's our interface. This is what you would go to if you go to uh, dev.glycam.org. Uh, dev stands for development. This is a work in progress. Eventually it will just be glycam.org. And you can see there are various icons that give you an idea of the tools and, and what's available to the user. If we go in and look at one, for example this one that says 3D, this is a tool that lets you generate the 3D structure of a sugar. If we click on it, then what you see is an interface like this lots of colored shapes and names. And you can click and it will guide you through how to build the structure. If you want more information, there are links that give you detailed documentation and so forth. What you can see in the, in the inset on the right is a traditional view of a sugar in the stick structures and then the view of a sugar in circles and squares. And what the circles and squares bring to the game is the ability to quickly recognize which sugar is which. Otherwise, they just look like a jumble of sticks. And this is particularly evident in this video. And this shows a protein, in fact, two proteins, one in orange and one in black, in the typical ribbon structure. And the sugar is attached to them in stick structure. As soon as they're displayed in three-dimensional uh, shapes, then you can right away see the different sugars. You can see, for example, the red triangle, which is fucose, which is absolutely important for modifying the, the function of this antibody. You can zoom in and look at the details, and with the circle and shape, circle and triangle shapes, you can see which sugar is which, and it helps you see what's going on. But 
What I show now is that sugars are not rigid and neither are proteins. And we can run things like molecular dynamic simulations, which you see here, and it shows the relative motion of the sugars in the system and the relative motion of the proteins. And you can see sugars move more than the protein structure. And this is the sort of thing that has to become easier for people to use and do through tools such as the ones we are developing. If we look at another case, this is a tool that predicts how sugars interact with proteins. Proteins are often receptors for sugars, that is the sugar binds to the protein. This could be to trigger a signaling reaction, it could be an antibody binding, many different events. Well, we would like to know sometimes what sugars bind to a given protein and how they bind. Okay, and here's a, a video that's going to illustrate this uh, idea. We're going to look at how a protein might bind to a sugar. And if you look at, for example, a protein here shown in gray, and there are is a sugar bound to it in the, in the circles and squares, there may be very many sugars that contain that motif that bind to the same protein. The question is, how do they bind, and why do only a subset of them bind, typically? So we would go through and make a list of all the different glycans in the human glycome, for example, all the sugars in humans, and ask which ones contain this minimal binding motif. Then we would put them in a list, and we would take the crystal structure or the NMR structure of the protein we would ask, can we build the sugar into the binding site? That is, can we model it in and does it fit? And if it doesn't fit because there's, for example, a collision, then we would say that's predicted not to bind even though it contains the minimal binding motif. But because we know sugars are not rigid, we allow them to move a little bit. We call this wiggling. So we allow the sugar to move in the binding site and if it can fit after wiggling, then it's a binder. If it still can't fit, then we decide that it's a non-binder. So to do this, you need a crystal structure or a protein with the ligand in the binding site. You need some idea of what binders you want to query, and then you feed it into the program. And it divides your data into those structures that are predicted to bind and structures that are predicted not to bind. Unlike artificial intelligence methods, this doesn't do it based on uh, an algorithm that you don't understand, this does it based on 3D structure, and so in the end, you get an idea of the reason behind the binding. If you want to give it a try, here's the URL in the site. So the last tool I want to talk to you about is developed also under uh, NIH funding. This is a separate grant. Uh, this is to allow users to find sugars in experimental databases, in particular in the protein data bank. It turns out that when the protein data bank was developed, it wasn't developed with the idea of storing data for sugars. It was, as the name implies, to store data for proteins. And it's been extremely difficult to locate sugars or to, or to assess their quality. So the simple question of how many sugars in the protein data bank has been unable to be answered until now. And it turns out that of about 150,000 deposited structures, 30% of them contain sugars. And because of the lack of tools previously, many of those sugar structures that are deposited have errors in their annotation or in their structure, and this leads to confusion among experts and non-specialists together. It propagates errors in crystal structures, and it really reduces the value of crystallographic data, which is really hard to get. So you need to find ways to find sugars and find the problems and fix them. So this site, for example, lets you find structures like this. This is a deposited structure and you can see some of the problems in it. There could be missing bonds, there could be distorted chair structures, there could be incorrect configurations. Remembering that sugar polymers are not linear, we have other details that need to be specified and those specifications can be incorrect. So with this tool you can find those and then later the proposal is that we will allow crystallographers to use this to find data find errors in their data and correct it before they deposit it. Here's an example of the output. One might be searching, for example, all of the crystal structures that contain this sugar and acetylglucosamine, or glucnac. The top three hits are three very different structures. The first one shows glucnac, that's a blue square, attached to glutamate. This is not a normal linkage, not a common linkage in a protein, and in fact it's there because this is an enzyme and this is a uh, covalent intermediate. The second structure shows 
a three, three blue squares with an OH on the end. This means it's a ligand. It's not covalently attached to the protein. And the third structure shows two blue squares, each attached, uh, attached in a sequence to an asparagine. This is called an n link glycan. So these represent three typical types of ways that sugars show up in the protein data bank. You can then zoom in and view the structures. You can extract much more information. And this is uh, available at the URL that I mentioned. What have we learned from this? Well, looking at this GlyFinder tool, for example, we find out that there are about 5,000 or a little bit more than 5,000 proteins that have sugars attached to them. Of those, there are 27,000 sugars attached to each protein, which means on average there's five glycans in a, in a glycoprotein. Does it matter? Well, it's something we didn't know before. If we look at the details of what's deposited, you can see glycans make up 30,000 structures. Oligosaccharides, that are, these are sugars that are not attached to the protein, make up twice as much at 70,000. Among the glycans, the majority are N-linked, that is attached to asparagine, and a smaller number attached to uh, serine or threonine, so-called O-links. So this is the beginning stage of the ability to mine experimental structural data that will help us link genetic information, protein information, and glycobiology to form structure-based hypotheses that drive forward the development of therapeutics and diagnostics to treat uh, sugar-related diseases. To conclude, I really need to thank some of the people involved. I won't mention everybody, but this has been a collaboration with the PDB involving Jasmine Young and her team. We have uh, senior people in my own group, Lachelle Foley, Oliver Grant. And I should point out that these tools are driven, the development is driven both by scientists and behind the scenes infrastructure development people, all the computer scientists. So in my group, we have bioinformaticians, computer scientists, chemists, biochemists, all working together on glycobiology. So I hope this has been a helpful video for you. Click on the links and send us email and let us know how it works. Thank you.